Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I can't see who's joining us. Is anyone joining us? I'll tell you right now. <laughs> the magic. <laughs> this shows that we're alive. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to see me dance, so. <laughs> Billy's in Florida! Very exciting. Yep, you are officially going. Hey, everybody. Happy Friday night live. We're here with Billy Hopeman from Answers Pet Food. We're so excited to have him in Florida. We've known each other for a little over a year now. Yeah, so. Seems like forever. Old friends. Old friends. <laughs> And he's finally here. We're so excited because I get to show him my little shop and Dr. Zach Pilosoff. You, of course, know our Dr. Zach Pilosoff. So what I love about our relationship so much is that we're all about the raw plant and he's all about the raw food. And you guys have probably heard me say this over and over again that I think the two have so much in common because every time we talk about over-processing food, we're like, yeah, we feel the same way. We don't want to over-process our cannabis. You know, we want to we want it to be not messed with because it's got everything it needs in it already, just like the food does. So we have a small group here. We're taking questions online. Um, I'm just going to, those of you who don't know me, I'm Angela Ardolino. I'm the founder of CBD Dog Health and the owner of Beautify the Beast, which is a small grooming um, shop, boarding, and we have a small section of natural supplements and food. Of course, we sell answers like crazy because we love it. I feed it to my nine dogs every single day. Um, and I am a pet cannabis expert, um, so anything you need to know, I'm here, and my team's here, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, how they work together, how we use them together, um, and that's who I am. I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Talk really loud so they sure. can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, I'm uh, Dr. Zach Polsoff. I'm uh, currently a... Uh, a traveling right veterinarian across uh, America, I'm licensed in several states, but at the same time, I've been working very quickly to catch up with understanding the two sides of where we sit in the pet and vet industry with um, pet parents and people that are not doctors on one side and then veterinarians on the other, and learning just how much knowledge each side has and planning the goal over time is to bring those two knowledge bases together and create something in the middle that's going to result in lifestyles for animals that can live longevity and have healthy and happiness throughout their lifestyle. And the reason why I'm here is because really just like any diet out there, uh, diets can be done right and can be done wrong when it comes with raw food. Um, if there's any company that seems to be doing it right right now, um, it seems to be Answer Pet Food is kind of taking the lead. Um, a couple of have as well, but very excited to kind of just sit with an expert on two sides of a movement of what is going to be longer, happier, and healthier lives of pets, and then be able to slowly evolve and join that as well. And remember, our vets are not taught about uh, diet and nutrition, nor are they taught about the endocannabinoid system and how uh, medical cannabis works. So I have set, I've gone traveled all over the country speaking about the benefits of uh, cannabis medicine. And oftentimes, I would be on a panel with a vet who knew nothing about it, or was saying THC was dangerous, or I don't, I don't know what. They never knew what they were talking about until I sat on a panel with him and finally met a vet that got out of school and went, how come I didn't learn anything about these things, and went out and taught himself. So it's awesome. I was like, you're coming with me. You're the only one I've met that knows all about this. So you're coming with me whether you like it or not. So that's we're so happy to have him on. And what's wonderful is that you're basically learning all about diet and nutrition and studying that now. So this is like right on and for them to be able to talk and share notes is I love to watch it. So this guy over here. So I am Billy. Uh, I am clearly very excited now. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, I am the nutrition science director for Answers Pet Food. So I do a lot of uh, things we're, we're we're sold in 49 states, but we are a small company, so we all wear a lot of hats. So what state are you not in? Uh, Alaska, which you know. Let's for, go together. <laughs> for, uh, yeah, for <laughs> obvious reasons. We are in Hawaii, which I've never gotten to go to for work, which is kind of a shame at this point. 
Um, let's arrange that together too, because we're in Hawaii also. Oh well, there you go. She's let's like, well, let's come speak the moment you can. I'm like, we'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> so I I'm involved in you know the R and D and product development part of the job. Everything from the conception all the way up to you know what's on the packaging. You know the words you can use into like regulatory. I I go to AFCO meetings you know twice a year. Um, I do all of our science education. Do you guys know what AFCO is? So AFCO are the people that regulate uh, pet food. So they are they actually have no legal um, authority, but they make recommendations to states that then give them legal authority. Um, so that's when you look at a bag of food, that's kind of what you can put on it is regulated, and the ingredients you use and that kind of stuff um, in order to do that. And we um, I do all of our science education. So I do uh, what's called Answers Academy, which is we do a lot of uh, sort of stuff that we, we don't want to educate you just on answers. We want to educate you on nutrition because you always come to the conclusion that we're doing the right things because that's what we base our, our food off of. And then I also run our veterinary program as well, which is um, we have about, I believe, almost 60 members in our veterinary program across the country. So um, these vets are either selling the food or recommending the food uh, and working with local retail stores. We actually have a lot of vets. We developed uh, disease protocols that vets are actually using instead of prescription diets now, which has been really uh, incredible because they can do that through Because you guys know that the science diet, prescription diets, all that's bullshit. <laughs> They're not really. And now you know that a vet who wasn't taught anything about diet and nutrition, they get a rep that comes in from Hill Science Diet and goes, hey, we've got it for you. We've done all the science and figured it out. So if you got a dog with kidney issues, just have them have the, eat the stuff in the can that's for kidney issues. If you look at any of those, um, they're non-food. There's It's absolutely non-food. And a lot of times it'll stop whatever the problem is, but it doesn't help it, it doesn't fix it, and there's no nutrition in it. So we feel for the vets because they thought someone has come in and taken care of it and you know, Hill Science Diet, Royal Canin, they're all owned by the same Smuckers, Mars, all these people who do not have your pet's interests um, in mind. And it basically keeps them sick. So they own the dog food company, they own the hospital, they own the prescription drugs that they get it. So it's just this big evil circle. When most of the problems, I would say that 75 to 80% of the dogs that come into my shop have major issues. And I just, now understand I've only owned the shop for three years. So I did not know that this was something I would see all the time. I now see dogs completely get healed with whatever their issues are with food, with their diet. And it's always their diet. It always starts with their diet. So. That's why you will never see us at CBD Dog Health say, take this CBD and everything's going to be fine. Well, no. And that's the premise is we want to start with food because we know that there's some situations where animals need to go on medication or whatever it might right. be. But we need to start with food and start to see if we can change it there. And we're getting these vets, which is great because it gives us more data to do these case studies. And they're seeing the same results and it's not to the detriment of, so you could say, you know, X food brought my uh, animal's kidney numbers down, but it was to the detriment of feeding a very high carbohydrate starch diet, and then they might be dealing with other issues. And so we're, we're kind of, uh, you know, going down that route. So basically the moral of, to sum up my bio, I work 120% of my life to uh, make sure that all of the, you know, we all do it answers pet food to make sure we can just get the food out the door and get the best possible thing. What are some of the things that you guys are dealing with that you have questions on? Um, I know that probably the biggest questions are uh, if you're switching, how to switch over. Is it something that you can incorporate food, uh, you know, if you can incorporate raw into something that you're already feeding? Um, are you already having an issue that's coming up that you're seeing your dog, whether they're scratching or itching or licking or whatever it is? Um, do you guys have specific issues that you want to ask Billy about? I know I do. Okay, for our three goldens, um, sometimes the itchiness and, um, you know, sometimes it's out of control, but it's like it goes up and down. So, what's the so, best way? 
Uh, the question for those at home was um, about itchiness for three golden retrievers. So how long have you been on, uh, I'm assuming, I, I know you're on a raw food diet, but on answers food? Or? Uh, I, my husband, I don't even know what it's called. Like, because he's the one that takes care of all of okay. He feeds them, he does the whole thing. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Is so, it a raw food? And it's raw. Okay. So that part, uh, going, so we do something that's a little bit different in terms of being uh, fermented raw. So if, if, if that, it's a little bit hard for me to speak to, let's say, the quality or the manufacturing process of, of something else. But the other thing, too, is when did you make that switch? Um, probably in March when my doggy stayed with Angie. Okay, so, Huge difference, yeah. so March, and how old are they? They are five, three, and two. Okay, so we have a five-year-old dog. Is Angie the oldest? Yeah. We have a five-year-old dog, a three-year-old dog, and a two-year-old dog. So we have been on raw food for less than a year. So. And what happened is that the three of them came to the farm to board, and one of them came with a prescription of Apoquil, which you guys know how I feel about Apoquil. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> so I started texting her going, what the heck is happening here? So that's well, how it all started, <laughs> and how the conversation usually happens is that there's an issue, so I immediately go to diet. Unfortunately, vets usually go to something that will stop the itching, um, and if it's not a holistic vet, it's usually Apoquil, and as Dr. Zach Pilosoff said, it's only, Apoquil's only supposed to be used like for a couple days to stop, and then you figure out what's wrong, So, right? There, yeah. I hate when I talk for you and you're sitting right next to me. <laughs> That's cool. No, yeah. no absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it, what's so beautiful about this relationship is that I can go, what the? And he can go, what do you mean? Apicool's great for what it does. And I'm like, yeah, but these dogs are on it forever. He's like, they're not supposed to be on it forever. They're supposed to be on it for a couple days to stop the crazy biting, itching, and then figure out what it is. But that's not what happens, whether it's, a vet giving the wrong information or the vet parent, pet parent abusing it and going, well, it brings them relief, but we don't see what it's doing to their inside. So that's why I was so crazy about it. I mean, it. that is valid though. I mean, I, I will tell you, um, and I do have an answer for you, but <laughs> uh, it is it is valid in that, uh, you know, I always tell the story that I, I used to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, consultations with health issues. And I would tell people, wait it out, wait it out. You just got to, Blah, blah, blah. But then when I lived in California, uh, Lua, my dog, would get fleas and I'd be like, oh my God, you scratch. What's wrong with you? How can I help you? Like, I, when it's your own dog, it's a hard thing. So let me guess. So you switched to a more uh, appropriate diet and it got better, but then you see flare ups and it just kind of, that's totally what we would see normally for an animal, especially animals that have been eating a processed diet for three, five years, um, that you're going to see that roller coaster of sort of you know, detoxing the system is what we normally refer to it as. But if you think about it, you sort of have to change their micro, their microbiome is going to change over that time. So I would totally expect to see some fluctuations in that. So because humans, dogs, it doesn't matter who you are, if your microbiome, which is, which, you know, we're finding through more research now has more of an effect on your whole body, even your brain at that point, your microbiome is your environment you live in and what you eat. And so if you're eating a high starch diet, which I'm assuming they were on like kibble or something before that, your microbiome is going to grow certain types of bacteria, which are not really that natural for dogs, in my opinion. And so it takes some time to sort of rework that. Especially um, if it's been a dog that's been on Apoquil, that's been suppressing their immune system. So a lot of times they'll have, they'll get worse before they get better. Yeah. So people will come off of Apoquil, go on a CBD and go, but it's getting worse. And we're like, no, 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 it's not getting worse. It's their body responding and then it's going to get back to normal. But it is tough. I, no one is ever going to downplay watching your dog or cat suffer or go through something like that is always very difficult. And so I totally get the need to want to change something every time something happens. But what we find is when we do these protocols, be it for itching, be it for, it could be, um, you know, anything that you can kind of physically see. Uh, I always have to tell people, do this for two months before you make any changes, right? If you see some diarrhea, if you see this stuff, that stuff will work itself out, but you need to see if it works before you can actually, you know, um, 
because the the pe- the the sort of trend is to be like I tried X and my dog got diarrhea, therefore they can't tolerate X or they can't. But that that's not true of just mammals in general. I mean, there's no. I mean, we literally go to events all the time and go, raise your hand if you've ever had diarrhea before. <laughs> I <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> do we run to the hospital every time we have diarrhea? We don't. So we don't have to do that with our dogs. Zach, when should we run to the, to the vet if our dogs are having diarrhea? Yeah, well, I, I can answer that. And I actually want to, there was something he said that was very good, actually. So um, so diarrhea, again, is is a extremely subjective group of what something see, someone sees. And, you know, diarrhea can be anywhere between an animal having a slightly looser stool or a different color stool to something that involves a large amount of blood that is really a detriment to their health. And so, again, the spectrum of stools is a topic that I personally love, but again, <laughs> it's something that's a topic I talk about literally every day between three to five times when I'm working in practice because of the fact that each dog is different, number one. Each dog has a norm, number two. And what is actually considered a pathological diarrhea versus what is considered a normal um, fluctuation in a gut bacteria that may be transitioning or something else of that nature. Again, the, the most important thing to look at is the dog. And is the dog clinically affected by what's happening or is this something that they're able to tolerate well and easily that you can manage in the short term while their body's trying to adapt to something. Um, now, the one thing I do want to mention, which was great, is that um, the way Billy put it in that the very heavy topic of what would probably be considered one of the top two or three conditions that pet owners notice and annoys them just as much as it annoys their pet is the topic of allergies. What you said was actually how, you know, what they respond to most is what you're surrounded with by what you eat. And that's very actually literal because of the fact that your gut is just your skin turned inside out if you think about what you're doing. And so what an allergic reaction is and what an excessive hypersensitivity reaction is, what we call kind of the medical side, is just your body trying to surveillance anything that it's, it is exposed to. And your gut is your skin just inside out. And so whether we're talking about a, an allergic dog the important thing to know is that food and the environment almost always play a role. In, you know, I estimate between 35 and 50 percent of dogs, and that's not something we should be surprised of. It it makes complete logical sense. And so, when you're exposing your dog to something that, whether it's right away or over time, their body is slowly, chronically getting annoyed by, you can get allergic dogs that are both to the environment and to food. And that's why we have this problem of continued fluctuations sometimes as well as the food may be changed short term with something where you are getting them on a wholesome diet but at the same time their body then still has to neutralize its overreactive response to everything that it's seen over the last several months to years in which it developed that allergic um, that allergic predisposition in general yeah so that's why that, that conversation is important because it's not a quick fix as we know in humans we struggle from allergies all the time and so that's something that we haven't really found a cure yet for, per se however if there's anything that's going to help to keep it as low as possible and even maybe find a resolution where you are sub-threshold to the feeling of being uncomfortable, then it starts with using food and diet as medicine. You should see how many calls we get at the shop of people who've moved to Florida with their Goldens who now are having issues because it's so humid and hot and they love to go in the water and then they get cute and hot. So you're battling both. But um, once you fix the gut issue, the allergies are going to be something little tiny flare-ups than, than the responses you're getting now. And even when you switch their diet, you still have to find the correct protein. Um, Answers, for instance, has a straight formula versus a detailed formula, which has the vegetables in it. Some of my dogs have to have the straight, some of them have to have the detailed. So even when you figure it out, you still have to figure out which protein works best for the dog. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the things to, that, that has been you know, great for us over the past you know, 10, 11 years of doing what we're doing is too, is just to look at the idea, kind of going off what you were saying, of, of how bacteria affect uh, allergies generally. And you can look at studies in humans, you can look at studies in rodents, you can look at other mammals. And we know for sure that 
animals are dealing with less allergies when they have a more diverse microbiome. So when they, when you have kids who are raised on farms, when you have, you know, all of these uh, uh, mammals around polyculture soil or on farms where there's animals and plants and they uh, sort of interact in that environment in these soil cultures, we notice that, um, you know, they have a better functioning immune system. And so that's, that's so funny. You just said that to someone that, today. Yeah, that's one of the things that we bring into our food is we actually, so on our duck eggs in the detail formula, and also in our fermented vegetables, we actually keep some of that polycultured soil on those items. And that is because uh, we want, it's, it sounds weird, we want your dog to eat dirt. Um, but it, it's really, I, I actually have a, like a, 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 my own theory that we're dealing with so many animals uh, issues with allergies not only because we have, what is the number one way you can affect, you know, your uh, human's gene expression and or a dog's gene expression is what the mother eats when she's pregnant. It's a huge deal, right? That, that's why whenever people are like, I'm pregnant, I can eat whatever I want. I'm like, no, you can't, <laughs> or you shouldn't, I swear. But, uh, but so that's the number one effect. So I think it's a two-pronged problem. And again, this is my, my own little theory, but I think it's, you know, the idea that you have a malnourished mother that gives birth to a malnourished mother that gives birth to a malnourished mother, and generationally you have these issues. But now we have dogs, too, that are so removed from dirt and from being around that positive microbiome. So to no fault of anyone's, I mean, most of us aren't taking our dog out to the woods. Our dogs aren't eating stuff in the grass and getting, and then the, the, the lawns that they are really um, exposed to are treated with chemicals. And so then how do you, you know, square those things. So where we come in is we, you know, with our foods and our fermented dairy and all the things that we do, we're going to inoculate your dog or cat with, you know, hundreds of different species of bacteria, you know, into the billions every time they're eating the food. And the other thing to point out too is that, you know, the probiotics you're getting from food don't last forever. So it's not like you could be like, I did an answers meal and now their microbiome is set. You have to continually inoculate your dog or cat system with those things. And the ni nice thing on our end is, you know, it just comes from in a food matrix in, in the food itself. And so that's, wh that's why I think, you know, we've seen a lot of relief in that area. So, sorry, my answers are like 40 minutes. I know. <laughs> I know. So, no, no, it's, it's totally fine. So for, a, uh, so for NJ, who's the five-year-old, is there a protein? Where would you suggest you start? with a protein for an allergic dog. Well, here's the other like real nerd thing that I think is so cool. So the other thing that happens, so a lot of people wonder in regards to our food is like how does, how does, how do the bacteria thrive if it's a low sugar environment? So most of us think about fermenting food, bacteria love eating sugar. So that's how we do beer, that's how we do wine, that's how we do all these different things. So the cool, the really cool thing about our food is we're putting all of those uh, bacteria into an environment that they're living first. So, you know, we have fermented cod livers, we have the vegetables, they're living in a food environment, so they become more virulent because they have the, all the things surrounding them that they need to actually grow. And we can track the growth with data that we have, right? Because we run tests on that all the time. So people often say, well, how do they grow in my refrigerator when they're there? So those cultures actually become proteolytic, which means that the cultures are gonna eat fat and protein and change it into usable carbohydrates. So what that means is it's kind of a parallel in some cases to a hydrolyzed protein. So hydrolyzing protein, you're changing the structure so the body recognizes it differently. And answers food, we find that many animals that are allergic to chicken or allergic to turkey can eat our food fine because of some of that proteolytic. In fact, sometimes we actually take animals that have severe food allergies have them take our food, soak it in our like fermented fish stock for 24 hours to further ferment it, and then they have more success with that as well. It's the same thing with our fish stock. You know, we have two billion probiotics at least per ounce in the fish stock, and there's basically no sugar in it whatsoever. So they're getting that, those cultures are becoming very proteolytic. So the nice thing is all of our stuff comes at a price range, right? Like we use wonderful pastured organic chickens. They are cheaper than our wonderful grass-fed beef that we get, right? So there's a spectrum there. So most people can can try to start at whatever level they want to. Um, but I, I, I tend to tell people to, like if you have animals that have 
uh, allergies and, and just have a lot of like skin, they seem like hot in a way, sort of, sort of on the Chinese medicine scale side, side of things. I tend to say like, why don't you start with something that's cooler on that scale, which would be like pork or duck or turkey or something like that would be, I mean, it's a good place to start, I think. Yeah, so make sure that there are at least the cool protein, um, especially for her, for MJ. And do you, Carson, do you recommend mixing up those proteins that they make a couple of ways to, can, to increase the exposure to different types of proteins within those cool proteins, or is starting with one protein and mixing in, you know, the balance of the other components to a so we're not going to I, if you're if you're talking about like an issue like this, I would probably start with one for a while until they're stable, and then. But once you kind of move around, then you want to change not just even protein exposure, but also all of our f foods are one to one fat to protein ratio. But that doesn't mean that the fats are exactly the same in each one because chicken is going to be different than beef just in in the structure of those fats or the types of fat. And so it's good to expose them to that. We also use different vegetables and different formulas, so it's it's good on that level as well. Um, but yeah, I think once you do get them out, but there are some animals who, they say, my dog only does great on your turkey. Well, they're still eating better than 99.9% .9 of dogs in the world, so they're still doing awesome and, and whatever works for you on that, um, in that way, so. Cool. Did you have any other questions about food and feeding them? I don't think so. You're welcome. How do you integrate, like, right now I give my dog kibble, but I mix it with the food that I made at home. You know, I made specialty food for her and save it. Uh, how do you do the transition on how to change to this food? Uh, so the, the nice thing is you're already making food at home, so the transition is going to be less difficult. Mm -hmm. So they're already used to getting different things in their system. So transitioning to food is created by humans. So this is not a natural thing, mm -hmm. right? The example I always give is there is no wolf in the wild who goes like, I'd love to eat that bison, but I've been eating rabbit, so I'm gonna eat 30% rabbit for two days <laughs> and then move them onto you know, the, the bison or whatever. So that's something we create, and I think it happens because we're giving them the wrong diet. So they're, they're, when you're talking about feeding a high starch, high sugar, high carbohydrate diet to something that's you know, naturally eats something that's very low in carbohydrates, and especially uh, is usually eating a very high high protein, high fat diet uh, versus that. The really cool thing is once you do get transitioned over, your dog can pretty much switch between things whenever and be totally fine. Like for instance, my dog gets something different every day from answers, um, and their stomach becomes more like our stomach because obviously we're not transitioning onto foods either um, in the same way. So what I would do if I were in your shoes, was I would first phase out the kibble with your homemade diet, mm -hmm. and then for like a week, I would just transition from little by little. So if you want to do it for a week, you could do 25% uh, answers for two days, 50% answers for two days, 75% answers for two days, and on the seventh day, you'd probably be fine. Um, I would do it that way. I'd phase out the kibble for your homemade diet, mm -hmm. and then I would phase out, and then I would phase into the answers food, and then you should be fine. And if you have any issues with, you know, like he was talking about, it's a very good point about the differences in stool. Mm -hmm. It should uh, take care of, uh, should take care of itself. And I would like to mention one other thing because you sparked my something about <laughs> stool quality, <laughs> which is uh, I always used to feel it's a great topic. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we can talk about stools. I yeah. used to feel bad for. Uh, I used to. I do. I work at coffee shops a lot on my computer, and when I was in LA, I would be. Um, at this like really fancy coffee shop and like it would just be email of, after email of pictures of poop and I'd be like, <laughs> um, so uh, the, the one interesting example I always bring up about stool because people think like stool quality is the number one indicator of if my animal's healthy. No, because kibble, yeah. the stool looks great. It's an indicator, right? So we put animals a lot on a milk diet, which is uh, for animals with chronic health issues or even the milk diet is absolutely incredible. So this is raw milk and water for any extended amount of time. It could be uh, 30 days or, I mean, we've had animals with serious chronic health issues that have been on milk that, uh, just raw milk and water for years, and they completely thrive. Um, or a dog that we cannot figure out the issue, so we want to start, we basically want to do a cleanse and start from scratch. 
the great way of doing it. Yeah. You know they're getting what they need without a solid thing in there. Well, exactly. And the interesting thing about that, though, is a lot of animals that are on the milk diet, that even animals that, for instance, have something like uh, pancreatic insufficiency or something, where the milk doesn't require work from the pancreas, so they're, they're able to thrive and gain their weight back, they'll have a yellow stool that's putting consistency the whole time. And that's totally normal because they're not eating any food. They'll also go to the bathroom sometimes every three to five days, like going poop actually every three to five days, totally normal. But that wouldn't be considered normal in any other circumstance. You'd be like, oh my God, do I have to go to the vet? My dog hasn't pooped in two days. And so it is good to give people an idea of what's going on. But I just want to mention that about stool quality. It can be, uh, you know, different. And... I didn't mention for MJ, who is suffering from allergies, instead of that Apoquil, uh, CBD will help tremendously. We have the Ease Tincture, which is um, also has frankincense in it and turmeric in it, which are both also amazing anti-inflammatory. So if you do have a dog that's still suffering from allergies and or there's the breeds that are unfortunately have been bred to be smaller or cuter or a certain size and they've just kept breeding the allergies into the one dog and it's hereditary now, it helps tremendously with that also. So um, anytime someone, and it, it can become a habit, you know, licking, even when you get rid of whatever caused the licking, it could just be a nervous habit. So I always tell people, I mean, we do it on a regular basis with Odie. Odie, stop licking. He knows what it means now. <laughs> so, and now he's gone deaf. So now I just put my hand between him and the paw, and he's like, <laughs> and I don't turn around over there. But, um, you know, you, we've got to keep that in mind also. Um, the, the CBD is a, a whole plant medicine. It's a food, you know. It's a plant. And it just happens to be my favorite plant that does amazing things for our bodies. Um, but getting rid of inflammation is probably the best thing it does. And uh, it, it will help. It will help the immune response if it's overreacting or if it's underreacting. It will help either way. It's an adaptogen. So the dog takes it, we take it, and it figures out, oh, this is what the body needs right now. And. Well, so, so from what I understand, it kind of just helps the homeostasis of the whole body, right? The endocannabinoid system is the master regulator. It, it is in charge of all of our other systems in our bodies to make sure that they are operating right. When they're off, it is responsible for trying to bring them back into balance, which is bringing, it, bringing our bodies back to homeostasis. And by the way, that, ladies and gentlemen, that statement is all I know about CBD. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Um, and, we, and we're also great friends because he uses CBD dog health on his dogs and uh, works great. As a matter of fact, if you've seen the video of a dog having static ataxia, which we're, I'm still not sure it's even static ataxia, which is when a dog is on THC, um, I think it was just her feeling really good. Um, but yeah, I've got, I've she got felt really videos. good falling into the wall. Yeah. <laughs> she, she looks a little she, drunk. She was very, very happy. happy. <laughs> I'm feeling good. And I was, I was gone actually uh, at a vet conference, and because um, she was, uh, Lua had jumped off the couch and she had uh, just tweaked her bicep, and she was just going through some healing parts. And I get a phone call, and uh, my wife says, "You know, I think she's doing good." She's sitting in her bed, but she's just staring at the wall. She's not like, yeah. Right. It's, it's crazy with CBD because, um, and I, you have to tell me if you found this too, because some dogs, it really activates them. So um, I know we had a cat this week who it really activated. So when a person's got, you know, maybe a, a cat or a dog that's not feeling so well, which is now bouncing off the walls and running around and like this cat constantly bathed itself till it was wet. Um, it's almost like you have to keep on going until it gets into their system and they balance out. So if your dog has a reaction where it's super happy and, you know, feeling good, it won't stay that way. It will balance out. Um, Nina, who has osteosarcoma, I'm giving her 8 to 10 milligrams of THC every single night. And she's already getting to the point where she's loopy, but in the beginning, man, it was 
funny. <laughs> uh, I would wake up in the morning and come down, and she would she likes to throw her head up over the chair to look at you like, ugh, already? <laughs> so you get her to go, and then you'd go outside, and she'd be upside down on her back, you know, in the sun or whatever. So you could tell she was feeling really good, but that super high feeling um, starts to diminish because it's getting into their system. Well, and I think, too, you know, sort of relating that to, to, you know, just food in general, too. I think it's important to go into things that uh, when it comes to, like, medication, for example, medication is more of, like, a, a way to, like, patchwork the symptoms in a lot of ways. So w that's not what we're trying to do. So in order to, if you're trying to heal through food or do that part of that equation there, a, a lot of people think it's going to function like medicine. So, like, okay... I have a dog uh, who has mobility issues. So we can give that dog a medication that will be very hard on that dog's liver or whatever it might be, but you'll see pretty immediate results because they'll be getting that. Now, the approach that you're doing, for instance, with food might be, hey, I'm gonna double up on the fermented fish stock. I'm gonna do this bone broth. I'm going to reduce inflammation in the body. I'm gonna do all these things. And the body has to react to that. And then the body has to start to heal. And that's gonna take time. You might see some weird reactions, but that's something to keep in mind when you're running through these processes is I'm not just trying to patchwork the symptoms. Food can, you can help with that too, but the real thing is you're trying to get to the root of the problem and try to, you know, uh, stop that. A, a good example of my own dog would be when she was very young. So she's from uh, a puppy mill, you know, she was born in a puppy mill, et cetera. So she does not have good genes to start. Um, and when I first got her, uh, you know, she had about, I don't know, maybe a grade three luxating patella in one of her back knees, which is where the knee groove is not uh, uh, grooved enough, so they, it pops out of joint. So the vet said, hey, you know, we need to do the surgery on this. And I said, well, I'm going to look into some other options. I'm going to try to do this nutritionally. Now, not to say that that's not, you know, obviously that's always going to be there to some degree, but we never had to, I worked on that nutritionally, we never had to do the surgery. And it hasn't really been affected her mobility her entire life. I mean, and, and I was able to do that. And having to go through a surgery like that is no small feat for, for any, you know, dog or cat. And I heard that they can do physical therapy now yeah. and everything to help a dog if you catch something like that young. Um, whether it's diet, physical therapy, CBD, all of these things. I, I always do that. Surgery? All right, let me uh, see if there's something else. Sometimes you medication? Might have to, let me right? see if there's something else. Of course. But, absolutely. but let's start with, and exercise is so huge. I mean, I always get into the nerdiness of talking about food, but exercise is a really big part about, even if we're talking about joint health, when you're, when older dogs start to sort of like, you know, their body's producing less collagen, their, their sort of, their joints are deteriorating more. You know, keeping those muscles strong by taking them on those long walks every day is uber important. I mean, I take that very seriously with my own dog. She's 14, she's a pug, and she can go for five-mile hikes. And it's because we keep her weight, right? So feed the right thing, keep their weight at the right level, and uh, keep them very active, and you at least increase the probability that they're going to live a longer, healthier life. So my big, my thing is focus on quality and hope for quantity. So focus on giving them the best life you can give them every single day. Because even if they're here for eight years, 10 years, 14 years, every day you want them to be able to move about so they can. You don't want them to be in pain. You want them to feel, obviously, the love factor is a big part of that as well. And so focus on that and then hope that they live forever. Right, but we know that all the dogs that have lived the longest, you know, like the Guinness Book dogs that are like, uh, you know, 30 years old when they die, most of them are farm dogs, right? Because the, every day they're constantly moving and, and running around. They're also exposed to some really great bacteria. Um, in fact, the one uh, in Australia that died, I think her name was Maggie, who was like 31. No surprise to us, she lived on a farm and drank raw milk every day. So you know, it was a. But that dog also ran miles and miles and also the other food that that dog loved eating every day was or not every day but her other favorite food was placenta which i think was very interesting so she would go ahead and help herself to the um i actually have a friend yeah. <laughs> so who knows i actually have a friend uh 
Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were here. Well, I knew you were so weird. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm saying this because I'm hoping uh, he's watching this or sees this, but my friend BC, who actually he lives in Indiana, he calls himself the Placenta King. He can actually get placenta. He got me a jar of placenta yeah. once. So um, it was rabbit placenta, so not easy to work with. Is so that the fruit? That is not <laughs> That is not something we could uh, necessarily put in our food. Um, a lot of people don't know that. You actually, there's a book called The Official Publication, which is recommended food ingredients that are deemed usable by AFCO, and most states actually go to this. So a lot of people don't know that we can't just put things that we um, that are healthy into food. They actually have to be in that book, um, or else we couldn't sell in most states. So it actually really limits. When we were making our cheese treats, uh, we wanted to put some, you know, we put like blueberries and turmeric and things like that. You know, I really wanted to do a bee pollen one. I thought that would be a really cool way to bring a totally different nutritional part of it. Bee pollen is not an approved ingredient for AFCO. So we had to open up to the, uh, the herbs and spices part. And we had to look and say, here's the 30 things that we could potentially put in here. Um, so Isn't that ridiculous? It is really it's the same, and it's the same thing for um, cannabis. Uh, we hemp can't be an feed, animal feed, because it is not on a list called the grass list, generally recognized as safe ingredient. But they won't let you submit it onto that list, so it is not allowed as a feed ingredient and like horse food or um, any farm feed. Well, another great example of what's not, uh, so on your label, you can only put certain things. So you could maybe put on the packaging and say, um, oh, this is grass-fed beef or whatever, but you can only put beef on the ingredient label because they don't want you to have that qualifier necessarily. But my favorite example of that is we use three, several ingredients to remineralize our food because the soils are becoming depleted year in and year out, even when you get good soil. Broccoli you ate 50 years ago had many more minerals than broccoli you eat now. We, we know this through testing. So we use ingredients to re remineralize our food, and one of those things we use is uh, sea salt. So we use, uh, for those who might say, like, I thought they use a southern salt, like anyone, like, watches me that closely. But <laughs> feel bad for you if you do. No. Um, so... Uh, we used to use uh, Selena Naturals Celtic Sea Salt, and we actually moved to a less processed version, which is Redmond Real Salt. This is salt that comes from a sea, an ancient seabed where a volcano erupted into it, and so we now have, you know, every trace element and mineral in the in this area. The food's better than the food we eat. Exactly. <laughs> so, but the crazy thing is, we can't even put the word sea salt on the label because that's not in the OP. As so, we that is the salt that goes into our food. But on the ingredient label, it just says salt. And so there's, if you read that, you'd be like, why would they put table right. salt in their food? But obviously, that's not what we're doing. So unfortunately, the, the legal definitions are made for huge corporations as opposed to, uh, so like a lot of the times, um, we were looking up, we were searching for terms that we could call a product we wanted to describe as jelly. And that was not. A descriptor that you can use and they're all very like um industrial terms like masticated something like they're all very very industrial um and actually to tie this back to what we were talking about with allergies i also think a lot of the allergy symptoms are based on the fact that people don't really know what's in their food so i can't remember who i was talking to but they they actually bought the op so you you all could buy the op but it's 175 dollars and it changes every year so you have to get a new one every year um, and they were actually saying, uh, basically they got the OP and they still couldn't understand what the ingredients were because if it says oats, that doesn't mean it's oats necessarily. It could mean it's, you know, a byproduct of something else that, et cetera. And so they actually reached out to that organization and said, Hey, can you help me determine this? They said, well, no, we can't help you, but we have people you can pay to consult the book, uh, and help you. So now you have to pay even more to know what's in your food. So a lot of this stuff is not what it's chalked up to be. So if you, let's say you're eating a dry kibble, it's not just that it's, you know, oh, this is too high starch and it has rice and oats in it or whatever it might be. It's the fact that that is the most industrial worst version of that product 
that may have not even had, you know, they're supposed to off gas all the chemicals off of it. Did they do that? I don't know. Um, so you're getting the worst feed version of this product. And I think a lot of that has to do with it as well. Now imagine five generations of dogs who eat that every single day. Um, so un unfortunately as a pet owner, all of the deck is stacked against you for figuring out. You really need to know the company that, uh, because most people go into the store and they go, look, it says it's completely balanced and, and, and the government regulates that. Not really. So you have to be your pet's advocate and figure out exactly what goes in your body. Same thing with cannabis. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think the important thing to really say is we zoom out for a second. If we focus on what we just talked about in that paragraph of trying to find a long-term balanced diet, um, incorporating regular exercise into your life, your pet's life, and then the abuse of pharmaceuticals in every way imaginable that kind of mimics exactly what's going on in human medicine. So this is not something that we should feel is different or new. Uh, when you also look at the fact that the level of and the rate of obesity in in pets is mimicked exactly by one or two percent in the uh, human in, in the human medical field. So we're not dealing with new topics here. We're just literally seeing the same thing that's happening in humans reflected into the the vet and pet industry. So these are topics that, you know, whether you're a healthy or an unhealthy human or you're dealing with condition or not, that they're not new, they're not novel. This is important to finding a lifestyle of happiness and healthiness. And as we also know, the lifestyle that we live here in America is very high energy and very high stress and also is built around quick, fast, easy. And so whether you're talking about pet food and you're talking about your food, our lives are meant for what's the quick fix right now, and then how do we react to now we're sick versus saying we're going to start off from square one with something that's going to promote, I like what you said, promote quality from day one and hope for quantity at the end. But we're not living like that in the highest majority, and neither are our pets. Is that a surprise? It's not to me, it's not. Is there something we can do about it? There's 100% something we can do about it, but it starts with square one. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I, I didn't even realize, I didn't put that together when it comes to like the human obesity rate versus the, um, versus that, that's a good point. Well, and I'm the oldest here. <laughs> so I also thought, have realized how much what we go through as we age, the same degenerative diseases that we go through, our pets go through. So, you know, just like all of a sudden we can't tolerate dairy or we can't tolerate that vodka martini anymore <laughs> whatever it is same thing happens to our dogs where that's why we have to change their diets is all of a sudden if you were i mean i can literally get someone walk in the shop look at the dog and i go it's nine years old and i bet it's eating a kibble that's a chicken base i just then i'll be like what are you feeding how old it's nine it's chicken it's the I'm like i knew it i can almost tell by looking at the dog now because it's so common i had no idea I thought what I was going through was just what I was going through. And now I know everybody is going through this because we've all been, we've all fed our dogs the kibble diets that have been sold to us and we had no idea. Um, and now we do. Does anyone else here have questions um, about anything? No? Well, and any on, online? Yes. Well, let me just. Uh... Um, I also wanted to say it's 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 very interesting to me because we work in the veterinary community and, and we do have you know data that they're looking for we do have you know uh, feeding trial data we do have you know we can meet the nutrient requirements all that stuff but at the very base of everything we're talking about we're trying to figure out we're trying to prove you know they're really asking us to prove through science what we know innately already that mammals do better on fresh and less processed food. Um, and it's just kind of trying to bridge that gap between this is something we know. We know that animals, that all mammals just do better that way. And so how do we go ahead and, pr and prove that based on, you know, because everyone's paradigm for the past hundred years has been dogs only eat processed food. Well, that's ridiculous. And it's just like when you were asking me and I said something, you're like, oh, just like in the human world, just like she's a nurse. So all the things that you already know on the human side applies to them also. Okay. Uh, Stephanie Doctor says, I would like to Hi, know. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. 
I would like to know if my 11 month old should still be following the puppy calculator or the adult since giant breeds aren't fully grown until two years. It's a mastiff. Um, I'm guessing, yeah, she's talking about our feeding calculator. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, I'm going to interrupt you just for a yeah. moment. I know a ton of people have gotten puppies and a lot of people think, I can't, do I feed my puppy uh, raw? Yes, absolutely. Start them off right. What they just said, this is something that you can do right from the beginning. Um, and we have a lot of vets that will say, uh, this was said to one of our clients, oh, he's a puppy, keep him on a kibble for the first year. And then if you want to take him to raw. Go to Dr. Zach, why is he saying that? No, it's the opposite. Probably because, and I mean, if you want to explain it, but basically a vet is worried that the dog's not going to get everything that it needs, that it's not going to be um, a balanced nutritional meal. So he's hoping that the kibble will give him what he needs. Well, just as he doesn't know about raw, of course he's going to get everything that he needs, especially if he's eating a raw diet. So yes, you could feed your puppy raw. We've got River, he's eight weeks old. He's thriving on eating his his raw. And that puppy is now eating raw and doing fantastic. And, but and yes. adorable. Like, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> you have to get him so we have to dog. show everybody. Yes. Well, the thing that's quickly important on that is that um, just, again, we, to use the word raw is a generality. So that client, that customer, that person hears that and then to go to the store and just buy chicken out of the package and then slap it on some steamed vegetables, that is not a balanced raw diet. However, now we have these companies such as Answers which we're taking the necessary time and effort to go and say, we have these kibble diets that have been formulated to meet the needs of an animal. Not sure that maybe they've been meeting the needs, but is that also in line with healthy and happy? Probably not. Most likely not. However, what it does is it takes the guesswork out of what it takes to balance a nutritional diet. And before, we've had this movement recently where diets can be raw and balanced and healthy and promote happiness. That was a risky endeavor. But again, what kibble does, it takes the guesswork out of how do you grow an animal up and then keep it alive. That's what kibble does. It grows the animals up and it keeps them alive with something that there's no guesswork and it's already portioned out for you. Now that we have companies that helps either portion that out for you with their food or we can consult and create a diet that's meant to meet the needs of every life stage, then that's where raw becomes a very relevant discussion. It's just going to take time to buffer the difference between just feeding them something that you bought at the grocery store instead of cooking it, just putting it in their bowl versus actually feeding a balanced diet that is raw. The word raw is a buzzword right now. And it scares people. It's just finding a balanced diet that's not just meant to meet minimum requirements. It's promoting healthiness and happiness. Fresh. That's a great point. The, the type of diet does not, uh, so, you know, you'll hear don't feed, you know, boutique foods or whatever it might be. The type of diet does not denote whether it's complete or balanced. You'd have to, you'd have to look at the individual diet itself. So to, to answer that question, uh, usually, yes, it does take large breed puppies are growing for longer. You know, usually if you're talking about like a small dog, uh, at six months, they can move to the adult thing. And it really is on a case by case basis. So typically the, it depends on what you think the, the adult weight will be, right? So the adult weight once, but I would stay with the puppy until you look at their body condition. And if, if their metabolism is, you know, their growth is starting to slow down, they might start to put on weight and that's when I would actually uh, kind of scale it back. So I would expect for a giant breed like that to maybe be doing that for like a year. Um, and then you just have to watch their body condition, but it's not an exact science. So if you think about how dogs are raised anywhere, I mean, think about a hundred years ago, people were just feeding scraps and, you know, letting their dog do their thing. Um, and so, it sounds like you're 11 months and you're still on there. So I would I would check that at a year and just start to experiment with the calories and, and how you do that. I mean, look at how adorable this dog is. And it had... And, <laughs> and he just started answers too, and he's in love with this it. This is my new dog. <laughs> Somewhere Lua's like, no. What's happening? That, what a star. Oh my gosh. The eyes on your dog. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want the nugget. I'm afraid of those things. I don't come near them. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie says thanks. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you for using our food. We really appreciate it. Stephanie Doctor is on here quite often asking questions. She's really, really cares about her dog. So it's awesome she's here. Um, Donna says, Hi, Donna. Uh, do you have tasteless CBD oil? My dog with cancer won't eat her food with the oil. I can't get it into her mouth or rub it to the skin of her ears. Huh. Well. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. No, it unfortunately does have a taste. Some dogs really like it because it tastes uh, like natural. Um, but yeah, the only way, it, it, I wouldn't put it on the food. I would try to get on the gum or in the ears. The only other option is to go up the butt. So um, I'm pretty sure they're not gonna like that. <laughs> Um, so I would keep trying. I always tell the people the story of my 18-year-old Chihuahua. She would not let me put it in her mouth, and so I literally would wait for her to go to sleep and slip the dropper in and squeeze it, and by the time she woke up, I was gone. <laughs> um, so I would suggest that. Um, but, yeah, that's the only thing. I'm putting on her food is you're going to waste a lot of the medicine because it's going to go through the digestive tract. Um, putting it right on the gums, it's going right into the bloodstream. Um, so I would just keep trying, even if you have to wait till they're asleep. And said so they had cancer? Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. I, I think that they'll prefer the dropper in their mouth than the suffering from cancer. So whatever it takes, yeah, I, I get know, it in there. Yeah, I know that it can be <laughs> difficult, um, but... Wait till they're asleep if you have to. That's what I did. Because um, if I didn't, she, the dog would have a grand mal seizure, and it was too serious, so I had to figure out. So I know it's difficult, but wait till she's taking a nap and she's asleep. That'll work. And by the way, this is what dogs do to people. It's amazing. So this puppy's up here, and he's just staring at <laughs> like, like no one else exists, and then the camera comes out. Like, this is exactly what dogs do. This is why we're all here, right? I will say that he just got a lot of love, River, on social media. So, uh, Kaylin once Hi, says, Kaylin. ask Billy when they will be in Canada. We heard rumors earlier this year. Oh, good. Well, thank you so much for asking. So, we will be in uh, Canada very soon. So, we're just... When they let us? <laughs> I, I won't be in Canada very soon for that reason, but we will be, our food will be. Oh, your food. Got food. it. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, that would help out a lot. So, the same thing with ours. Yes. Stuff too. So we actually have a distributor who is about to place their first order for, for the, the sort of central to western part. And we are working on the whole country, I would think, by the end of the year. So we're we're really excited. We know there's a lot of. People who have been asking about Canada, it's actually a little bit more work than you think, you know, with all the border border stuff. But we're super excited, and when we can, I know this summer I was supposed to do a speaking tour, tour with Julianne Lee, uh, who's a vet in Canada. She's not uh, a vet. So, well, I mean... Uh, she opened the first vet. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. <laughs> no, because she but, said it to us every time. Yeah, She's like, I'm not a vet! For, for uh, I, I should say, for, for lack of a better term. And so I was very excited to come to Canada, and I'm excited to come in the future. But the food will be there before me, and that's the important part. Awesome. Cool. The last question was, I was probably going to ask Dr. Zach this, was uh, success rate for a dog with Cushing's? On CBD? Just in general. Well, what we know is we know that um, a full-spectrum hemp extract shrinks tumors. So if it's an adrenal um, tumor that's causing the Cushing's, then it most of the time shrinks that tumor, which then makes the symptoms of Cushing's um, go away. So we have, we always talk about Potato, our uh, Cushing's dog right now, and she's thriving. Uh, she still has Cushing's, but she sleeps through the night um, without peeing, without getting up and getting water. Uh, her tumors we're treating, we give her, what are we giving her now? Are we doing one full dropper a potato. per potato? Yeah, uh, minimum. So we Not give her about two. 42 milligrams at the beginning. We were giving her about 100 because um, she had uh, multi-centric lymphoma um, here. She had the little tumors all over her, which is why we named her t potato. But um, thriving. 
So we, of course, went the other way around and went, okay, why is this dog doing so well on it? And that's when we just, that's when I literally, I had no idea what Cushing's was until I had somebody's dog who was taking it and saying, oh my gosh, could it be helping the Cushing? I don't know. Let me go see what Cushing's is. So um, if it is an adrenal tumor, then that's how it's helping. It also regulates so, their hormones, which is... also regulates their hormones. So it's it does a lot. She's asking how um, a full spectrum can help Cushing's disease. So that's kind of how not knowing anything and not being a vet, how I've seen it help some of our customers, clients, whatever you want to call them, patients. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it really depends on... It, it won't, well, the answer to the question is we have no idea. But when you look at what um, Cushing's disease or hyperadrenal corticoism is, it's a, an abundance of a steroid hormone that's created by the induction of some type of tumor. And although it's a benign tumor, and again, the discussion becomes more broad because of the ways in which Cushing's either initially develops, which we still have a lot to learn about, um, at the same time, where is the initiation for that tumor starting? As there's two locations, it can be either in the brain or in the adrenal gland. And the reason why it can be in the brain is because of a small little component called the pituitary gland that tells the adrenals what to do. And so if you have a tumor in either of those locations, again, we have no idea if one is more responsive than another, if both respond, if there's something that's needed for one versus the other. We're finding out in humans right now very heavily that it's not just, for example, the CBD, but a lot of other components that act as lock and keys for certain types of cancers and other types of diseases that helps to regulate and helps to suppress what is, in this situation, overabundance of something. So the conversation is extremely diverse. What we know is that Angie knows more than that in terms of seeing it happen in real life. Because as a doctor, I can't do it still in my practice. However, when you hear stories of Cushing's being mitigated and even resolved by giving cannabis, it doesn't seem like that would, would be so ostentatious in any way for the fact that it is a cancerous growth. Where the location is and how it will respond can be very different across different animals. But is there a chance that it helps because it helps with other types of cancers and is a full spectrum hemp product that's been vetted for safety, something that you should consider outside of the practice? There's no reason why not both of those can be options. Cool. And then Answers has a full protocol. For... We do. If you reach out to us at, at info at Answers Pet Foods, we do Not it. at Billy. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's not a real email address. <laughs> I know his email address. <laughs> and his cell phone number. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that's true. So, um, I noticed I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Just waiting for you to say it over the thing. <laughs> um, so, um, we, uh, we have an endocrine protocol and also... Uh, so each of our protocols has a descriptor of, you know, why, why we think it works, you know, and all of this is based on uh, case studies we do. And then we also have a worksheet in each one of those that describe that will, if you go from step one to all the way to the end, you can figure out exactly how much to feed your animal. So, you know, it could be sort of a multi-pronged thing. And I think that'd be a good starting place. And then you know, if you need to follow up with going to get medication or going to the vet and, and seeing about specific things, you know, the food, it, we, we've never seen any side effects from it. So um, I don't think there's any real risk there. And of course, the dog that I'm talking about that I've seen so much, she went, she's 14 when we got her and I'm sure she was on a kibble diet and I went straight over to Answers and she's thriving. Has the best poops out of everything. <laughs> <laughs> and if you actually look on our website on the reviews, most, I'm going to say 60% of them on here are all about Cushing specific, about quality of life getting better. Yeah, on I the mean, tincture. what happened is that we had a um, client who was taking it for a tumor, and she's the one that said, Could it possibly be helping? And we're like, Well, how do, why do you think it's helping? And she's like, Because I'm sleeping through the night. She's sleeping through the night. I don't have to get up anymore. She's not drinking as much. She just, and I'm like, It's possible. So now that I know what it is, it makes sense. Um, so anytime, you know, it, literally people call us. Every day. <laughs> a ton of calls every day. And of course, you get, I, this, he spits them out like no, no problem, but I can't remember half of them. And we'll literally Google it, see what causes, where, what is it, and then we'll be able to go, yep, or nope, 
you know, type of thing. Um, but because it is an adaptogen, it can help so many different things, whether it's to help the immune system um, do something or whether it's to calm down the immune system. Um, I would love for you to just talk about, you know, when do you give the milks and the broths and how you incorporate them? Sure. Um, you know, because I get that a lot. Like a lot of people will use the foods but don't really understand when you should use yeah. the broths. One of my favorite things about the broths is that they have collagen in them. So if you do have a dog that's having issues with its gut or has leaky gut, it actually heals the gut. So they actually can drink a broth before they eat and it actually will coat and help them digest their food even better. So they're really important and awesome. And my dogs go crazy for them. We call them the goat's milk and cow kefir doggy ice cream and they go crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, first of all, I'd like to introduce you all to my new dog. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know I was gonna get a puppy coming to Florida, but here we are. Uh, no, so we were the, you know, we're very proud to have, uh, you know, going on 10, 11 years ago, we actually introduced the concept at large of raw milk into a dog or cat's diet. So that was not a thing uh, before that. And so, because there was a lot of questions about can this be distributed, all that kind of stuff, uh, because raw milk for human consumption is legal through across state lines. But for pets, we can do this um, all over the country. And, and people were a little bit so like... It's almost the same like with us. We have to put literally on our salmon treats, we have to put not for human consumption. Yeah. He has to put that on the goat's milk for the dogs. Yeah, exactly. So so it's it's uh, it at the at that point people were like, Why? Why on earth, you know, there's an idea that uh, you know, there's there's sort of something that's prevalent which doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense when you really turn it on its head and that is, you know, the first thing we got was why do adult animals need milk? Why do they need dairy? Um, so the first thing you have to do is combat sort of that argument. Now that is not a nutrition argument, that's a philosophical argument. And it's actually not a good philosophical argument because it's based on what's called a logical fallacy. It's called an appeal to nature fallacy, which means, and if you base your argument on a logical fallacy, this is getting really nerdy every life, <laughs> then uh, it's a self-refuting argument. Um, so, because things in nature aren't good or bad they, based on the fact that they're natural, they're good or bad based on the, the actual outcome that they have in the animal or the person or whatever. So once we got past that hurdle, um, here's how I think about raw milk. So what are we trying to make as humans for dogs? A food that has everything they need, but our, limit, our, our scope of science is limited on that. So, what is one food that's made by biology and evolution that has everything that a mammal needs? It's raw dairy. So really in our essence, we're trying to create milk for dogs and cats because it's something that they can live off of. We've proven this, that they can live off of milk. The other misconception too is that, well, goat milk is made for baby goats. Well, goat milk is very similar nutritionally to human breast milk or cow milk or camel milk or whatever milk you want to do. There are, there are differences but they're not, your body is digesting it virtually in the same way. So the speciation thing doesn't uh, really hold much water as well. So I like to break it down like this. We make uh, a food that's complete and balanced by what we can know from physics and biology and you know nutrition science, but nature does that as well. Eggs are another food that are basically, because it's a reproductive food, are you know um, a complete and balanced food. So we have, Imagine your dog's diet like a pie chart. So you can fill, if they need 300 calories a day, you can fill as much as you want as with any of those complete foods, and that will be, in my opinion, a balanced diet. So you could do the our detailed formula, which is you know complete and balanced. You could also do as much milk as you want within that. You could do, you know, we have duck eggs now, which are organic pasture-raised duck eggs. So you could do that as well. And I will say this, our food is wonderful, but we don't see the two products that we see the most healing from is our fermented fish stock and any of our uh, fermented raw dairy. Because milk is just different than all foods. And because of the fact that it's made by biology and evolution, you know, over, you know, arguably what, billions of years, um, it's just, it just reacts differently. You know, it, it has everything, it 
you your dog or cat will get a hundred percent of all of those nutrients every time they drink it which is really uh unique to milk i mean if you're if you eat an orange you're only going to digest you know a certain amount of vitamin c that's just not true in that case the other advantage that really brings is that one third of it is not digestible by you or your dog or cat it's digestible by the bacteria that innately live in it in the gut it's literally made to set up in the gut and to proliferate because it's building an immune system that's the whole point of milk is to not only build your immune system um, but to give you the nourishment of everything you need so my go-to diet for um, any healthy animal is the recommended daily amount of either of our fermented raw dairy products the recommended daily amount of our fermented bone broth and our detailed formula so you get that extra support it actually kind of goes from our senior protocol is that but double the amount of both of the stock and the milk because you want that extra support there so that can't really be understated the other the other thing i think is very interesting about food is that so a lot of people think oh if i put processed food that's devoid of moisture and have a bowl of water next to it that they'll get the moisture they need because they take that huge drink. We know that's not true because you can actually reference studies where they looked at dogs that eat food with its innate moisture. We know that they retain more moisture than animals that eat a dry food diet because that's not how uh, nutrients are designed by in nature to be digested. Water is the number one nutrient your dog or cat needs. It's also the delivery system of basically all nutrients. Right, and so why do you think so many cats get kidney disease? Because they're getting this uh, protein that is devoid of moisture. There's a reason why on our kidney diet, you don't, you know, we have animals that aren't using a phosphorus binder. It's not because we're reducing the phosphorus. It's because that phosphorus is in what's called colloidal suspension, so it's suspended in a bunch of water. And what does nature do when it wants to make food? It puts it in even more water. So milk is obviously very high in water and moisture content. And the reason why is because the nutrients assimilate quicker when that happens. And so what I love about raw dairy uh, for dogs and cats is all of those nutrients are then most bioavailable. And that's what grew our company. When we came on initially, we were a raw food company, but the milk was what really was different and grew our company. And that's where people were getting uh, the best results. So we have, I've worked with so many dogs in the past 10 years that even keep feeding the food that made their dog just generally sick, and then they start adding just the recommended amount of milk, and they see a complete turnaround in health. That, I, to me, is how powerful uh, raw dairy is. And I just, um, you know, on a personal note, I spend a lot more time. I moved to Pennsylvania, so I spend a lot more time with our goats and, you know, our cows and, and stuff like that. And, and they just amaze me in that they can do something that's better than we can. So I love our food, but I think milk is, sorry, I got up on a soapbox there. <laughs> I was getting more passionate as the conversation was going on. That tends to happen. Um, but I just can't say enough about it because it continues to surprise me exactly the impact in health, out, uh, in health outcomes in dogs and cats. Yeah. Can, you just, can you just make, can you make sure you define the difference between the milk that you're creating and then something they can buy off the shelf? from the source. Of oh, that's a good point. So that we don't assume Just like that, you don't go buy yeah. the, the chicken or the piece of meat to feed them, you just don't go buy regular milk. Yeah, so the interesting thing about milk is I think we should change the terminology because technically, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a little stage fright. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're all like, just <laughs> making a puke. I told you this is gross. Yeah, it is. It's a milk. Oh, you're fine. There you go. Nothing even came out. Hey, Baker, <laughs> I just want attention. He's like, I'm wearing a. He's like, I'm wearing a sweater. So I'll fix it. Um, oh, oh, oh. So, so. <laughs> I made it worse. <laughs> <laughs> Some doctor. Anybody else so, have questions? Or? Well, let me explain. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. We didn't so, answer the milk. Thing. Yeah. So we were all, uh, we were, now, I think he's doing better now. Yeah. So uh, milk is, is, I think the terminology could change there because technically milk 
should be raw milk because that's what it is. It, sh it should technically be milk and then processed uh, or heat processed milk. So milk is one of the most delicate foods. So as soon as you start to go over like 110 degrees, you really start to degrade. Basically anything you can buy in the grocery store is going to be pasteurized. So here's a really interesting thing that will tell you the, the sort of difference in how you um, look at milk. So 20% of the protein in raw milk is whey protein, right? As soon as you pasteurize milk, those whey proteins actually change in structure to something different. So you don't have any of those left in the actual milk itself. All the enzyme activity, which we talked about, you know, milk has every discovered enzyme, uh, is, is completely neutralized. All of the innate bacteria that I was talking about are, are gone. The vitamin content typically goes down. The degree to which depends on the actual thing. So the idea that, you know, we're going to pasteurize milk and, and make it safer, um, in our case, it's safe because it's coming from animals that are out on pasture that are eating what they're supposed to eat, but also the fermentation also uh, helps keep it safe. But for me, there's no real point, in my opinion, to pasteurize dairy because you're, you're essentially, it's, it's actually funny because there's a lot of built-in safety mechanisms to milk, which are also denatured. Uh, denatured. And the last thing I'll say to, to kind of bring this point home is that one of the enzymes in milk actually tells your body how to assimilate the calcium in raw milk. And so you'll oftentimes hear people say like, well, actually, did you know that cow's milk leaches calcium from your bones? Obviously, that's not true because it would be leaching calcium from a baby's bones too at that point. But pasteurized milk is different. So one of the ways that they actually tell if milk has been pasteurized is if that enzyme is denatured. So now, how is your body going to assimilate that calcium correctly? It's probably not going to. And so raw milk is just a completely different um, thing. So if, if it's between pasteurized milk and no milk, I would say no milk. But if but raw milk is definitely something to... And that's a great point because I, I'm around it so much, I forget that people don't understand that milk at the grocery store is going to be totally different. So. Totally different. And it also reminds me of cannabis, that the more we um, process that and mess it up, the more you ruin the um, medicinal properties that are naturally in it. Yes. Someone said, save the life of one of my foster dogs with raw goat milk. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. One of the other products you guys carry is the Kefir. Can you talk a little bit about what is Kefir, what role does it play, you know, where does it sort of fit in with the rest of the answers dietary world? Yeah, absolutely. So we make a fermented raw cow milk keeper. So sorry that um, if anybody's watching this and you've been short on keeper on your orders, we apologize for that. We I shot it. <laughs> we, we moved to a different farmer, and uh, we are now in production. So by the way, and just a, another side note, if for some reason you can't get the quartz and the pints, we're producing a lot of half gallons right now. So uh, order the big one if you can. Um, so a lot of people get down on cow's milk. Um, and part of the reason for that is because most cow's milk is uh, produced through Holsteins, which is an A1 variety of milk. And essentially, without getting you know super into it, uh, casein is a is a protein in um, milk. It's actually the number one. It's about 80% of the protein, and it's made up of a bunch of amino acids. And when we overbred Holsteins, what happened was we took out some of those amino acids and put other ones in, and our bodies didn't recognize it the same. In fact, there's a lot of people who have A1 deficiency or are A1 intolerant who actually think they're lactose intolerant. Uh, one of the good measures of that is if you're lactose intolerant and you can't eat cheddar cheese, you might be A1 intolerant because cheddar cheese doesn't have any lactose in it. So just something to think about there. So we use goats and uh, Jersey cows, which are both A2, so the body uh, responds to that a little bit better. Jersey cows also have a really high fat content, which we love. Remember, fat is not bad, and it's about 5% uh, milk fat um, in those. In fact, I go to a local Jersey cow farmer in Pennsylvania, and that fat line is like a quarter of the milk jug. It's an amazing thing. And so we find that our kefir grains survive better. Uh, and I will also add that we are so anal about our production in terms of how we go about producing things. We uh, Steve, who you love, <laughs> um, the guy who makes the broths. Uh, he also starts the keeper. Um, I say that because Steve is the favorite of everyone who does our tour. Um, so Steve starts our keeper with keeper grains, which are a colony of yeast and bacteria. So it's sort of similar to like kombucha. Um, they both kind of coexist very well together. We take grains from Pennsylvania, 
California and um, uh, Wisconsin. And we start them separately, so we get different culturation and all those, and then we combine all of those for every batch of kefir that we make. So kefir is all the things that I mentioned. So about you know the most complete food, it's raw dairy, it's all those things. The spe the thing that it has that I, that I really like about it is it does have a very good yeast culture in it, and so a lot of animals that we work with reduce their that have yeast issues so yeast overgrowth in their body they reduce their carbohydrates to zero and they still have that yeast issue because they're they're so vir the yeast is such a virulent culture a lot of times yeast will outcompete you know normal bacteria so what we find is that with that inoculation of good yeast because there's always going to be yeast present that we continually inoculate it our our yeast protocol roughly 50 percent of the calories are in that yeast in, or are in that kefir which produce that yeast. So um, we find that that can be the tipping point to actually getting over that yeast issue. I will tell you, you know, in my own experience, my pug uh, doesn't have a, a huge yeast issue, but the only time she has no yeast whatsoever is when she's on a milk diet for extended periods of time. And so the kefir can be really great for that. The kefir is also great at putting on weight for animals that especially, we worked with a lot of German Shepherds that can't keep weight, um, and we've been able to uh, keep weight with that keeper. Um, and I'm working on a um, protocols, an athlete protocol, and also a, I'm doing this live because now it'll force me to actually do it. <laughs> and I'm also, because uh, there's always a million things, right? And also a pregnancy protocol as well. And so the kefir, we've had a lot of success with animals who are nursing and animals that are pregnant because it's such a it's such a dense um, amount of you know calories and it's it's um, and then also too weirdly because it's very hard to predict what cats will do. Uh, we find that a lot of cats like our kefir better than our goat milk, and it might be the ferment, it might be it's a very thick consistency, um, but. Uh, we find a lot of cats really like that, and so getting your cat to eat anything that you want is a nightmare. So that is a way to uh, to do that as well. So it's really just um, an alternative. So I would recommend if you are the average person at home, you're saying my dog doesn't have any health issues, just switch between the two. So buy your quart of goat milk this time, then buy your quart of kefir, and just kind of rotate. They're going to get different cultures. They're going to get slightly different nutrient profiles. Um, and the other cool thing just about animal products in general when you raise them correctly is you're going to get that variation in seasonally. So that's the amazing thing. It's like a good example of that. So I live in a place where I can fortunately buy raw butter uh, very easily, you know, from directly from a farmer. And when we go during the winter, there's less butter because there's less milk and that butter is very white. And when we go during the summer, there's way more butter and it's very yellow. It's the brightest yellow you've ever seen, and it's because they're eating fresh grass. So the, the cool thing is there's more keratins in that because they're eating that fresh grass. So you might say to yourself, how much milk does, how much vitamin D does goat milk have? Well, it depends. Did that, was that goat, what forage did it eat that day? What uh, was Five that? Five days of sunshine. Yes, was it, was it cloudy that week? I mean, really, it really depends on uh, the animal itself. So I think, I think that's cool. Um, in order to get that and, and be sort of more in tune with nature with that. So that didn't really have to do with your question. I just think it's cool. So. <laughs> and again, I love making, you know, talking about how cannabis has so much to do with uh, whole foods is, um, I forgot my point. <laughs> <laughs> I agree 100%. With what you I'm saying. hungry. I couldn't agree more with that statement as well. See? So. What the hell was I going to say? Yeah, well, while you're thinking about it, something that's important um, to mention there is that everything that you described there goes against conventional society right now. Right. So people want, again, the guesswork is taken out of it. So if they're buying something to either treat it or they want a life of longevity, it doesn't matter. They want the same thing every time. And so to say that my milk in December is going to be different than the one I'm buying in April, that is scary because then they the variability of what they're putting in them or on them is not known and we're tailored to be in a, almost a fear-based approach almost all the time in society being afraid you know that things are going to happen to us and that we have to be afraid of all this stuff but really the way that nature intended is that longevity is bent based on balance over time it's not about every single focal point point. and so if you're going to balance a diet that's 
revolves around natural sources, then it will balance itself out over time, maybe not within the next three minutes. So that's why so that's it's better to balance that. over a week instead of feeling like you have to do it every day. And humans have a really hard time with the concept you just put out. Right. Yes. The not knowing is the I, hard part. And that's what I was going to bring up. I remember what I was going to say is that cannabis is the same way. If they got more sun, I could use the same darn plant, the same darn seeds. Every time I make a batch, it's going to be different. It's going to be a different color. It's going to be a different taste. It's going to be different. And that's because it's a natural product. So we all think that you know we're used to going to buy a pharmaceutical or even something at the grocery store which has been processed the heck out of it but it looks the same every time it tastes the same and that's that's not what we're dealing with we're dealing with something that's all natural um so we get that all the time it's always going to look a little different matter of fact right now we are trying to move where we make our salves to someone else and it's we are trying to remake it, and we know that people will freak out if it's a little bit of a different color because we're moving manufacturers. So these things and natural products is a normal thing. Um, so and, I, and, and, and the way it should be. I have a great example of that that happened to me this morning, actually. So another thing that is different is, you know, uh, so we have, for instance, our duck eggs. So chickens you know, are not vegetarians, so chickens should be, you know, out in the sun, they should be, and it's in the same way, if they're eating grass and bugs, if they're out in that culture, you know, we, we can measure those nutrients to the, to the degree that we can measure nutrients and know that the, the nutrient complexity of an egg can change completely uh, based on what that chicken ate or, you know, it's it being outside. And it was funny because I went and bought, so the, the mark of a good yolk is it's going to be bright orange. So... Um, I found this farm in Pennsylvania, and it has the most neon orange uh, yolks, which I get excited about, of course. But it was funny because on this trip, I had bought the best eggs you can buy. I went into, you know, uh, Whole Foods, and, and I tend to try to do that on the road to eat healthier, you know. Um, and I was cracking some of those eggs, and they were completely yellow. And I, in my head, was like, this chicken needs more sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> this chicken needs to eat more bugs. Like, what are you doing? I paid for this. What? <laughs> what do you think? But it is that variation. It's like I'm sure it that egg would depend on that chicken. I mean, and so you know, and luckily I'm not. And the same thing with our food as well. And I I always like to give this disclaimer because we get a lot of questions. Remember, our food doesn't have any preservatives. It's produced in small batches, made of actual whole cuts of actual food, and we ferment it. So keep in mind because we get this question all the time you will experience different taste, texture, color, smell, everything will be different and that's okay. And that's actually a good thing because again, we're getting variety and you know, we ferment it and we know it's safe because we, we go ahead and we do periodic testing of what is the pH level. We do periodic testing of what is, you know, how much bacteria is in it. So, but the ferment's gonna be a little bit different every time. So you're gonna get that variety of, of different cultures or, or you know, nutrition. And we'll even find that sometimes um, maybe our product, our uh, strains of cannabis that we use aren't the best. So if, for some reason, if we do get someone that's not responding to something, we'll suggest a different strain or a different product because it might react better. They're literally now going to uh, science and research is going, ooh, this strain of cannabis with this profile is great for breast cancer or for colon cancer. So we will get to the point in cannabis where we'll be able to be super specific. But right now, even with Nina, I'm using other, I'm using medical uh, cannabis that I get at the medical dispensary here in Florida on my dog because I know how to use it. But I'm doing that and I use different strains because just like he said, I want to be able to treat her with as many different ones because I know it's going to help. I want that variety in there. Well, do we have any other questions from anyone? Yeah. yeah. Um, a question. So one of the favorite things I learned from you at one of the last slides, because you've been talking about um, complete imbalance and not all complete imbalance is made equally either when um, I'm a big fan of Dr. Davin. He had mentioned in his book that, the, that a lot of the diets are like the minimal amount of what it means to be complete imbalance, whereas we all have feeding trials to for optimal health. 